Hi, everybody. This is Audrey from Real Food Comes Dirty. And we are going to be talking about the fall garden today. It's a very um, interesting time of year, to say the least, isn't it? Uh, and I think we've all experienced a lot of changes this season with how our summers went. So many of us had uh, very drought-filled summers. Some of us had a lot of rain. We had temperature swings. So it's kind of been uh, soup to nuts uh, that we've had all over the place. So in last week, we ended up with a bit of a discussion about botulism. And I did a lot of research on that this week. And uh, we're going to get into that. But why don't you, all the, the those that are here, uh, why don't you tell me what you like the most about the fall garden? Like, what's your favorite piece as we change these seasons? Hello to Marjorie. Hello to Robin. Hello to Rob. Hello, Graham. Uh, and Amelia, hello. Uh, I think Amelia likes Halloween. Is that what I see? Oh, it is supposed to be a bit warmer. We're going to have, from what I understand, a lovely Monday night. It's going to be warmer than it normally is, and it's not going to be raining which is very unusual for Halloween because it's usually always freezing cold and rainy. So I also think based on like our time zones and our growing zones, I feel like we might be moving up a growing zone uh, because we have had, we have had plenty of frost uh, since we got to October, but we're not going to have a freeze until maybe mid-November, which is incredibly late uh, for us. So I think whatever's going on, we are, I guess, reaping the benefits uh, with a longer growing season, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure in the long run if that's a good thing. So I, I'm going to start off with talking about the botulism discussion that we started last week. And I got to tell you, I... I was pretty shocked when I read up on this because this is um, pretty severe. Uh, and when we're talking about botulism, uh, oh, maybe we should finish talking about fall first. I'm sorry. I might have pushed that in a little quick. Uh, Graham is saying, here, I'll pull him up. that he loves the colors on the trees as they start to drop their leaves. That's my best part of being on our allotment. It changes everything. You know, yesterday I noticed how beautiful the two trees are on my front lawn. They turn bright, dazzling gold uh, with a little orange in them. I'm stunning. This morning, looked out, over half the leaves are gone and are laying on the ground. So it's like that minute of that beauty and color. And it's once the wind starts blowing, that is gone. So I agree. Fall is one of my favorite seasons. I prefer to be in a light sweater. Um, I just, I, I love the feel of that. And I love how the air gets a little crisp outside. And we are still able to grow a few things out there. Uh, but you can tell that for us, the big deep winter is coming. Uh, Rob is saying that he wants to thank anyone from the chat that has subscribed to his YouTube channel. Awesome. Uh, Rob also says every day is a new picture to look at this time of year. Isn't that true? Uh, that we... Things change so rapidly that it is like a different picture. And then I don't know if 
if you all live in snowy areas or not, but boy, once the snow starts coming, it's amazing what that does to the landscape. Uh, it just makes it beautiful. Oh, and Amelia is saying that she loves the color of blueberry leaves uh, in the autumn. Oh, nope. That was Rob. That's not, you know, I, I got a really wide screen monitor and sometimes it's just a little too wide. <laughs> uh, here we go. Amelia. She loves the color of blueberry leaves in autumn. And if any of you have ever grown blueberries, I mean, they become this gorgeous Julie. Uh, it has some colors of red in it, some colors of plum. Uh, they're just, they're stunning. And, uh, well, hi, Danny. Good to see you. Can I, can I brag that you did your first live last night and did a great job? So thank you so much for popping in over here. Uh, so we're just talking a little bit about what our favorite thing is uh, in the fall garden. And we've hit a couple of, oh, crepe myrtle. Oh, here we got to go look at Rebecca's. I did not know that about crepe myrtle. I think I'm going the wrong way here. Uh, here we go, Rebecca. Okay, here we go. So sorry. My crepe myrtle has fiery red leaves in Georgia. I didn't know that crepe myrtles did that. And how beautiful that even in Georgia, you're getting a bit of uh, fall. Because I always picture Georgia as just always being incredibly warm. Uh, so that's that's amazing. Uh, we've got a cold, wait, Catherine is talking about a cage that she just put up. That looks interesting. I just finished building a cold weather cage around my two green stalks and that are now residing on my porch. We'll see how long the salads and strawberries last. Also set up my green room or grow room in the basement. Awesome way to extend your season. I would love to see a picture of the cage you built around your two green stalks. Um, I love my green stalks and I have kale in one that hopefully is going to take us uh, a bit through the winter. And one has my strawberries, which as you know, they're going to start going dormant for the fall. Um, and then I have a third one that I did have some herbs in and I'm going to move that and make my, make two of the green stalks for next year. A lot of my brassicas, cause I have some uh, insect netting that fits over it. Green stalk made some uh, beautiful insect and cold weather netting. So I'm going to try the insect netting and see if I can beat those darn uh, white, cabbage butterflies, which were really my nemesis this year. They just really were. So I was about ready to never grow those again because um, they just, they were just eating everything and it was really annoying. So, okay. So I think we can start talking about botulism again. Well, let's get back to that. As I said, I was very I don't know if I was surprised, but I realized how much I really didn't know about it. Uh, and I never want to say anything Oh, here on the show that is wrong. So I was a little, um, when I said I had, I was storing some of my garlic and olive oil, uh, I did have a few, or uh, one person who said, can't that produce botulism? And I didn't think it could because it was in the refrigerator. Well, I was seriously wrong. So apparently with botulism, water is the enemy. And 
like you're putting garlic cloves into oil, but the garlic is holding on to a lot of water. So that is the breeding ground for the botulism. So uh, that's why when we're canning, if we do some home canning, we need to use a pressure canner when we're doing non-acidic foods uh, because the temperature will be raised enough to kill any botulism spores. Uh, let me, there's like a, a, there's a danger zone in food. And if you've ever watched, you know, Hell's Kitchen or any of those Gordon Ramsay shows, he always talks about, you can't leave stuff uh, between these degrees and expect people not to get sick. And those temperatures are between 40 and 140 Fahrenheit or between four and a half and 60 degrees Celsius uh, for two hours. If your food is at that zone, you need to consume it right away or process it more. If for more than four hours, your food is left at those temps, you need to get rid of the food because there's no way to guarantee that it has not started to uh, convert the spores into botulism. So, uh, and when you pressure can things, again, pressure canning is for non-acidic foods, uh, it will reach about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 121 Celsius, and that kills the botulism toxin. So it makes the safe, the food safe. So if you want to infuse oils, which I was doing a little bit of, only use dehydrated product. So if you want to make a garlic oil, uh, dehydrate the garlic, then add it to your olive oil because there's no water now. So there is no, there is no worry that botulism is going to develop. If you want to make thyme oil, that's great. Just use dehydrated thyme. So I thank whoever said that last week because I sure learned uh, a whole lot uh, about what the risks are here. And it's, it's very serious. So don't take it lightly. So I threw out any of the garlic that I had in the refrigerator that was being stored in oil because I thought I'm not, nobody, you know, a good oil or good garlic is not worth getting people sick over. So I kind of get rid of it. So take the, just take that to heart. Infuse oils with dry things, not with anything that has water in it. So as we begin to talk about this transition fall time that we're in, you know, it, it becomes kind of a big topic because we all live in, you know, very different climates very different uh, growing capabilities. Uh, so some of us can grow right through the season. I get a little jealous of those people, but I realize, you know, I live in a place where we have four seasons and uh, at least one of them is very adverse to growing things outdoors. Uh, so, I tend to start growing my things inside. And this year I'm going to do a bit more of that. Uh, not just, well, a lot for YouTube, like we need to have, uh, I, I wanna give people options who don't live in a climate where they can grow year round. Um, now October in many ways seems to be like the beginning of the year for me because it's when our garlic goes in and you know that's like kind of to me the big that's my big first planting of what's going to come out of my garden next year i know that many people with milder climates can be planting you know purple sprouting bro broccoli that's not going to get harvested uh till the early months of next year so you might Think of your, you know, beginning of your year when you plant your purple sprouting broccoli. Uh, 
but I, I think it's a good time to kind of look at it as the garden is not dying. The garden, is, the garden is prepping for the next growing season. And I think giving beds a rest, uh, not all of them, if you obviously, if you live in an area that you can use them, but to let the grounds uh, kind of do a little repair. Now, I usually at this time of year will begin uh, laying compost down, uh, freshening up my beds, and then putting some kind of mulch over the top so they can rest and the worms can do uh, all that they need to do to take the compost down and refresh the bed so I can start next spring with a new, with, with fresh plants. I also always, uh, I always mulch after I put compost down because you want the compost to become part of the bed uh, so that the nutrition is available when you start planting again. And some of the ideas for mulch at this time of year, I mean, leaves to me, again, depending on where you live, but I mean, I've got bundles and bundles of leaves here. And I do use a lot of that. Some of it uh, can also be used to make a leaf mold uh, to really compost your leaves. Uh, I don't have composters here. So I put a lot of, like we just um, emptied a bean bed today and that bed's going to be for my lettuces next year. So it's been a little prepped uh, with the roots of the bean plants, which have nitrogen nodules all over them, but it won't be immediately available. So I'm, I cut off the bean plants and I'm going to leave those roots in the ground so that they can uh, get the nitrogen back into my soil. But after all the beans were picked off, I chopped up the bean plants and laid them back on top. That's going to be my mulch for this year. And I realize I haven't yet put compost on that bed. So I might throw compost over the top of it and then use leaves on top of that. I mean, anytime you can get organic matter into your bed, it's all good. That's, you know, it's not always necessarily a fertilizer, uh, but it is going to provide nutrition because it's uh, a natural compound. So don't, don't worry if you get sometimes out of order, uh, you just need to do it. Uh, and I think uh, prepping our beds, whether we're still, you know, whether we're tucking them in for the winter, which is kind of what I'm doing. Uh, but it also helped if you're continuing to grow, beds are going to need some form of nutrition annually. So you can kind of figure out uh, when that is for you. And I've even done some beds where I have added the compost while there were still things growing in the bed because this was my opportunity to do it. So you, you kind of need to figure out a time that works for you and works for your planting schedules to also, you know, to get that um, good nutrition on top uh, and make way for a better year. Uh, do any of you grow indoors over the winter? I did want to talk about that for a minute. Uh, I, like I said, I'm really kind of upping my, you can see this uh, shelving unit in the back here. That's being converted to my grow station. And I will be, actually, I have my microgreens going right now in the kitchen. They're looking wonderful. Uh, and I think it was Jesse 
from plot 37 was talking about growing uh, cucumbers indoors. So I'm going to grow some cucumbers up those uh, corner, corner uh, beams, I guess, corner the edges of my growth stuff uh, and see if I can, I can harvest some cucumbers in the middle of winter. I think that would be great fun. Uh, but I do grow a lot of lettuce in the winter uh, under my grow lights, which is, it's lovely to get um, fresh lettuce in the middle of winter. I'm going to try growing some radishes in here, maybe even some beetroot. Uh, I'm, I'm going to push the envelope a little bit this year and see what I can, what I can do. Uh, yeah. Yes, Rebecca, you are lucky to be able to grow uh, year round. I, I think it's a, it's an incredible privilege. And yet sometimes it's nice to have a season of rest. Uh because I've always had one, but I, I do want to push my indoor growing this year. Uh, Graham is saying he overwinters uh, his chilies. And this year he's going to grow all, go all out to grow indoors. Awesome. I think the more we can figure out ways to uh, grow our own food, particularly if we love to do that, um, that's only going to be a good thing. Steve uh, at Seaside Up grows them indoors over winter. Hmm, what does he grow indoors? Steve at Seaside Up is like, he's one organized dude. That's all I'm going to say. He's got it. Uh, he gets it done. He is phenomenal at what he does. Robin Miller uh, is saying uh, that she grows some micro greens on a small scale. End of February, I start next year's longtime items. Uh, now, what um, what area do you live in, Robin? Because I we're gonna on potty mouth garden club we're gonna start our onions on boxing day because that's how steve has always done his and i'm like well he's a really i've never started mine that early but i'm gonna give that a try um oh you're northwest chicago okay yeah that's you're pretty cool there in the winter too uh, and you get some nasty winds over there in Chicago, don't you? Uh, my son's in Chicago right now. So uh, a little familiar with that. Yes. Um, Amelia is saying that she starts. Let me find you, Amelia. Here we go. That she starts her onions December, Chili's January, Tom's February. Well, I'm going to join you there starting my onions in December. I do start my chilies in January. I don't start my toms till February or till March, but um, that's pretty darn close to what I do. And I know we we live in very different um, climates. Okay. We've got Carline. Between my two arrow gardens in the mudroom and my basement grow room, I'm hope to grow lots of green leafy veggie. Perfect, because they don't need pollinators. So there's so many things that we actually can grow inside, and we don't even have to do our own pollination. You know, there's many ways to for us to pollinate without pollinators. But boy, if we can grow things that we don't even have to do that with, it's wonderful. And um, in this grow area that I was talking about back here, these four, these are four two foot by four foot shelves that I have back here. And I have um, 
lights for all of them. I do uh, I have uh, I have trays that are two by four feet that fit under my plant um, okay, my where I pop my plants in little modules, you know, 60, 80, whatever it is. And they sit on there and I have a wicking system that self waters. And it's really wonderful because I can let a lot of these go for almost a week uh, in between waterings because they have a wicking system, which is wonderful. Uh, and my husband's actually going to pull water up from the basement so that I have a spout right here so I can take care of that like super easy. So um, I think it's one of the points is we all have to kind of adjust to the environment that we are in uh, to see what works best and how can we like keep the growing going without, uh, without depending on the grow. I love, okay. I love being able to pick and pull, pull it into the kitchen and turn something into dinner that night. That for me is just, uh, that's a real pleasure to me. And I think it's a real luxury and I love it. Um, so there are ways that even we can do that uh, if we can't grow outside. Okay, Robin has a question. Uh, let me find you right here. Here we go. Do you cut the growing alliums to spur root growth? I did it for the first time in 2020 and I really feel it improved my outcome. Interesting. Uh, I have seen some YouTube gardeners that do cut the tops of their onions off and then use those as like green onions and then let the onions continue to grow. Uh, I've also watched uh, Haas, I believe it's Haas tools, and they're like big into note. You need to let the greens grow because that's what put, puts energy into the bulb. So maybe this year I'll try cutting some of them and not others and see what happens. Um, but it's interesting to see that you found uh, improved your outcome. I think that's great. And I think that might be worth at least testing, right? And maybe cut off part of your allium tops and other ones just leave. Thank you. Thank you for that, Robin. Um, I saw something that I was going to, oh, here's what I was going to comment on. I just ordered uh, some, it's called Super Soil. And um, I first heard about it on Steve at Green, wait, Digwell Green Fingers, okay? He's a hoot. Uh, and, but he did some testing on this and it was crazy. So I have just ordered some and I will kind of let you know how that works uh, because apparently it just really builds microbes in the soil, which is what, uh, that's what enriches your soil. It helps keep moisture in your soil. Uh, they're wonderful little microorganisms. So I'm going to give that a shot and see how that works. And I will sure let you know, cause I'll do a few tests myself because I've never heard about it in the States. And then when I went on their website, they are located in Ireland and I, I'm just, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to do a few tests. Uh, yeah. Rob is saying super soil seems to be good. I have not seen a bad test yet. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to give it, uh, give it a try for sure. Okay. Oh, my notes go. Where did my notes go? So did any of you say you grew in sight? I know some of you did, uh, but you probably, a lot of you can actually continue to grow outside, which like I said, I'm a little envious of, but uh, I applaud that. So for growing in see, inside, you know, depending on how sunny your home is, you're typically going to need some uh, additional lighting. Uh, I run a very, very low uh, wattage, full spectrum uh, fluorescent light. Doesn't pull a whole lot of um doesn't pull a whole lot of electricity, which I like. I have a small one uh, in my kitchen that's LED, which also does not pull, it does not pull a whole lot of wattage. And that's where my microgreens start. But once I get this shelf set up, I will be able to move uh, some of them into here. Hi, Sophie. Nice to see you. I understand we're going to be on Potty Mouth on Monday night together. Looking forward to that. Okay, so tell me, what do you do in your gardens in this fall going towards winter? I mean, even in nice areas, winter's winter, right? It, it, it will slow down your growth outside even if you have the opportunity to do it. It does slow things down. So tell me, how do any of you prepare for this next season or prepare to go through the winter? Uh, even if you're outside growers, which again, I'm a little jealous of, but you know, we all, we all have our things, right? Uh, you got to do some things to your garden just to keep it going. Oh, how nice. Uh, Graham is saying that Steve at Digwall sent him uh, some of the super soil. Lovely. Yes. So I'm, I'm so anxious to hear how all of this does. And then, uh, yeah. And he was a guest on Steve at Greenside Up the other day talking about it again. And I thought, you know what? I just need to get some of this stuff and give it a shot. So so how do you how do you guys prepare uh for the upcoming winter? Well you just don't expect me to talk the whole time, do you? <laughs> I probably could, but uh, sometimes after these, I almost get sick of hearing my own voice. So, oh no, Graham, that's interesting. I have not heard that. Let's pull this up. Um, Um, I don't know that I heard that. Uh, I've always heard that full spectrum is kind of what they want. Uh, that would be interesting if anybody else has any thoughts on that. Um, and where did you learn that? I'd just be curious. Um, well, Robin said she just put down some super soil. Yeah, I think they say it takes like maybe four to six months to uh, to show like maybe some progress. And I, it's also interesting to me that you can put it down at any time because I kind of was wondering, me knowing that I'm going into a really long period of cold, you know, I guess I thought, 
uh, I probably should wait till spring, but they're like, no, get it down because that's how it starts uh, to work. So I'm going to do that. Okay, Sophie is saying, or Sophia, I'm sorry. Gosh, uh, where are you? It's your first winter, so you're still building, and then reading some books to get me ready for the next year. Awesome. Like, use it as uh, a time to get educated, to learn more. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we can all always learn more. That's the beauty of gardening. Nobody knows everything, and there's always something to know. That's why I like to ask you guys questions, because there are things that come out of here that I've never heard of before, I've never tried before, and I've been at this over 30 years. So I'm thrilled to just, I, I think that's what keeps gardening interesting for me. I can get bored pretty easily with things, but there's always something to learn here. And uh, that always keeps me going. Andrew is saying he digs over his allotment during the winter and I let the frost do its magic. Come spring, all I have to do is rake it over and ready to plant. Amen, brother. Yes. It's amazing what nature will do if we just let it um, have the time to do it, right? And we don't always have to get in the way. Okay. Uh, wow, Amelia, that's, she needs to build a new fence, lay slabs in the greenhouse to stop the rats. Well, you know, isn't this a great time though, too, to get some of those jobs done that you just don't have time to when things are so actively growing and you harvest and you're just, you're just trying to keep up with what's coming in, right? So winter is a great time to get some stuff done that you haven't been able uh, to work on. So good for you, Amelia. Okay, now, Rob, how do you know that people who grow cannabis use red lights? <laughs> is that what you're growing up in that attic? Come on. <laughs> uh, here, I got another. Uh, this is Jean. Hi, Jean. We've been to the allotment today, took plastic pallets up to make three, oh, to make a three bay compost area. We planted lots of brassicas, dug the whole plot, and add plenty of horse manure for the spring. Wow, that was a that was a good day's work. Good for you. Yeah, wow, that was great. I'm tired just listening to that. Yeah, that was a lot of heavy work. This is Pauline. Uh, she still has chard. Yeah, my chard will not stop. I, I mean, I just love it. It's an incredible, it's an incredible product, isn't it? Swede, carrot, kale, and beetroot. I have field beans started, uh, which we harvest the tops as grains during the winter. What a great, I think field beans, I wish I could grow those uh, through the winter because I think, wow, those roots uh, completely nourish your soil and yet you still get the green tops, which as I understand it, are incredibly delicious and lovely. To be able to get greens in the middle of winter, like I said, that's why I grow a lot of lettuce here in my home because how nice to get fresh greens that you know didn't come from uh, you know uh, the other part now for us I, there would probably be greens that are grown um, in the south here but still it's hundreds and hundreds of miles away how nice to be able to pick your own right and i still have carrots and some beets my beets this year did not did not do so well so i'm gonna try to uh, grow a lot more of those next year and see if I can't find out why they weren't happy. So thank you. This is from Robin. She preps 
a layer of leaf mold topped with chopped leaves on the veg beds. I leave the other beds for the animals. Well, you know, uh, we were just talking about that the other day that we don't really feed our birds. You know, we have some bird feeders in our yard, but we don't feed them so much in the summer. We feed them a lot in the winter because I think that's when they need it. So the fact that you're leaving the other beds for the animals, I think that's great. We all have to kind of do this together, don't we? We're kind of in their playground when we're out there growing things. So, so thank you, Robin. And okay, this is from uh, Graham. I tried with the full spectrum and my beans went to flower as soon as they sprouted. So I spent, and turns out, oh, okay. I've never had that occur, but good for you. I mean, you know, we're kind of spoiled that Google is so available and, you know, probably 90% of the info is pretty darn correct, depending on where you're going. Uh, so awesome. So I hope that that gives you a better bean crop next year for sure. Uh, okay. This is a comment from Philip. Regarding supersoil, I applied a kilo of supersoil on 10 acres of grass, vastly improved the quality of the grass, but not the quantity. Still had to spread slurry to get enough grass to, okay. So you saw a great improvement in your grass. Awesome. Uh, because I'm thinking, I, you know, I garden in a suburban plot and that was one of the other things I thought of was, well, I bet my grass would probably enjoy a little bit of this super soil as well. Um, so that's awesome. Thank you, Philip. Uh, let's see. I have two chat lines going here. So... Hi, Stephen. Thank you. I'm doing great. Uh, okay. I read it. Okay, Rob. We'll, we'll believe that. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Thank you. Um, Amelia. Amelia has carrots in the greenhouse, chard, beetroot, carrots. Austrian cabbage, tree spinach. Now, what exactly is tree spinach? I have heard that a little bit from a lot of my UK gardening friends, and I'm not sure I know what that is. Uh, spinach, onions, and Chinese celery. Awesome. You've got a you've got a whole garden still growing there. That's awesome. Okay, this is uh, Addie, 80, not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. If the super soil works for you next summer, will you prep the soil you use for winter with it? Now, from what I understand, if you use this super soil and do not use chemical fertilizers with it, which I don't use, it's kind of a one and done. So I'm not sure. Because, uh, you know, I kind of think, well, if a little works, wouldn't more work better? Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but that would be when I would probably apply it uh, in the fall. Because I like that the garden gets a chance, at least mine, not to have to grow anything. So it can just kind of uh, repair itself get ready for the next season. So if I were to do it next year, uh, that might be when I would do it. And honestly, if I find that it's not doing a lot for the soil, uh, I might, I might do another application in the spring 
just to see if maybe it was because I had such a cold winter. But who knows? Uh, we will see. And I'll let you know how um, it goes for me. This is from Stephen. He was out today clearing the front garden of all the leaves, removing all the summer bedding plants. It's very mild here in Scotland the past week, aka very wet. Uh, I'm 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 very familiar with that. My um, and I've probably told you this, so don't. Um, if I said it before, just ignore me for the next few minutes. My parents were born and raised in Glasgow, and I spent the majority of my summer vacations over there because that's when we went to see family. So I was very aware of how nice and uh, damp it is there, uh, meaning it rains at least, well, at least it seemed to me, and I was, you know, more of a kid at that time, but it seemed like it rained almost every day, at least for a little while, which uh, as a gardener now, I wish I could get my uh, garden to be watered by rain once a day. That would be like optimum, but uh, Oh, interesting. This is from Graham. I was thinking similar with super soil, putting it into my compost heaps. What do you think? I don't think it could hurt. Uh, I mean, that's the reason anybody would make compost, right? Is to try to get that the microbiome, so to speak, of the dirt, of the soil better. I sure would not, I, I would see no reason not to. I think it would just make it richer. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, if I've missed any questions or brilliant comments that I need to see, if you could just type them in capitals, that would um, help my, uh, I, I, you know, I have so much sun coming in from the window that I can see I'm all washed out here, but it helps me with my glasses take a little bit of glare there. I think I've said before, I need to get a shade for that window, but I will, I will, it will be coming. So are you guys planning to grow anything new next year that you have not grown before? I always think it's kind of a fun challenge to try to grow at least one or two things that are new, not necessarily um, a variety, but are you, are you thinking about something that you just have never done before? Amelia's going to grow nine star broccoli. Don't know that I've ever heard of that. Good for you. I, again, I think it challenges us and keeps us uh, learning new things. And it, I don't think any of us are ever too old to learn something new. Asparagus pea. But I think Jesse said it's not that nice. I think I grew, I, I don't know if it's the same thing, but I grew one. Uh, it, it like kind of had, it almost looked like a square pod. And at the edges was like, it was like fringed. Uh, and they were not, they were not tasty, but I'm not sure that's the same thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Wish I could tell you, but that, I, and I forget the name of the one that I grew and yeah, it was not, it was not good. Okay, this is Carline. I'm planning on planting more perennial veggie, veggies. One is, oh boy, don't, I will try to pronounce this, Hoblitzia. Um, I tried growing hibiscus this year for the first time. 
uh, and because I understood it was really good for tea. The problem is it never blossomed. I've got this beautiful red architectural uh, bush out there and absolutely no, blo no blooms. So no tea for me, I guess, is really. So I'm going to definitely try to grow that again next year and uh, maybe change my fertilization schedule with it uh, because mainly I fertilize with organic uh, fish fertilizer. Uh, and that sure didn't seem to do anything for these plants. I mean, they grew big and beautiful, but absolutely no blooms. Okay, Jean is saying, I would like to try sweet potato next year and aubergine. I um, ordered a new a strain of sweet potato this year and it was a it was more of an ornamental sweet potato but it also and usually you know those ornamental sweet potato vines are sterile they're not going to produce a plant but the ones that I bought this year said they're they're beautiful they're gorgeous uh long vines that you know are like the spillers out of your pots but they also produce some sweet potatoes. Uh, so I have a big pot on my deck and it's gotta be three feet in diameter. Um, and we were cleaning that pot out the other day and oh my goodness, we found a whole bunch of sweet potatoes. And I thought this was one of the sterile vines that I had put in here. So, that was kind of an unexpected harvest, which was fabulous. Uh, the trick with sweet potatoes, Gene, if you've never grown them, they like heat and they like a long, so as long as you can give them, uh, they will just keep growing and producing for you. And the vines, if you let them like crawl along the ground, the vines will root in at the nodules, like where there's a leaf, and they'll they'll make another root, and that will form more sweet potatoes. So very prolific, uh, very happy, and uh, eggplant to me, it, it grows just like a tomato. So, and I'm sure you've grown tomatoes. So good luck with you. Good luck to you on those, because uh, those are both very beautiful to pull out of the garden. So yeah, I was thinking of making, I, I, I successfully grew celeriac for the first time in a long time. And uh, I was gonna make a sweet potato celeriac mash. So we'll see, just to give it a, a try and try something different. Uh, Leanne is saying she's going to grow purple sprouting broccoli and tree cabbage. Awesome, because tree cabbage, I think, is a perennial as well. So that's one of those things you will uh, enjoy for a long time. This is from Andrew. He's going to try some different tomatoes. Uh, it's interesting, the different tastes. Oh, isn't it? Like one is, you know, ma, and then the next one is like, okay, that's probably the best tomato I've ever tasted. It's it's crazy to me how different the exact same fruit off of a tomato plant uh, can taste. So yeah, good for you. I always throw in a few new varieties every year because you just never, until you grow them, and taste them, you just never know, right? Uh, so good luck with that, Andrew. Oh, and this is Carline. Uh, and encourage and eat more wild stuff. Oh, okay. I, you know, I have purchased yellow purslane seeds and I have not yet planted them because purslane is 
a pretty significant weed around here. And um, yeah, so I've just been scared they're going to take off. But maybe I'll put those in a pot because I understand yellow purslane is absolutely delicious and almost has a little bit of a citrus note to it. So um, yeah, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, you guys are great with all these, uh, answers here. <laughs> okay. So I think we're, oh, Rob is going to try some melons next year. Good luck with that. My biggest problem with melons is knowing exactly when to harvest them. I mean, I have, I have a good idea. I know it's about smell. It's about, you know, watermelons. You got to knock on them and they sound kind of, you know, hollow, but I, I am always, I'm so much better at harvesting uh, winter squash. No problem with those. Uh, but I'm just going to keep growing more and more melons until I figure out exactly that moment. Because you want to get that moment when they're just going to be, you know, off the hook good, right? Because that's the fun of growing a fresh melon is that you want it to just burst with flavor. And I know you don't want to, you know, water them right before you pick them because you want their juices and sugars to all kind of coagulate or, you know, not coagulate, concentrate. And yeah. So it looks like, it looks like we're pretty good. We're almost an hour. I can't believe this goes so quickly. Um, but I thank you all. Oh, hi, Steven. Yeah, that's okay. We missed you too. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, here's one more comment that I think is useful, at least maybe to me. Uh, it's Carline. It's about purslane. Ordinary purslane has a bit of tang. It's really not a weed. Well, it's kind of a weed here. Only maybe it's just very invasive. Uh, eat your hostas. Wow, never done that. I've never, I don't grow hostas because I feel like they're, I don't know, I never grew them. Uh, but ordinary person has a bit of a tang. Okay. Well, again, I think it's maybe just very prolific around here and maybe spreads quite easily. Yeah, thank you, Robin. She was saying the key is for harvesting melons. Yeah, and I do look for that. I just don't find that it always works. And it might be my expectations for the fresh melon uh, are a little too... Here we go. Uh, she's saying the dry tendril... And stem hardening a bit is key to a melon ripeness. Yep, I've done all that. And I also think it should remove from the uh, stem kind of easily because, you know, we don't cut them off with the stem on them. And they should smell. And I've done all of that. And sometimes I get it right and sometimes I don't. So anyway, I think we've been on for about an hour. I thank you all so much for being here. I know you're taking time out of your life uh, to spend time with me and uh, that does not go unappreciated. Thank you so much. And next week, same time, same place. And I will put up uh, a comment or not a comment. I will put up something in the community board as to what we're talking about so that maybe you can 
uh, have conversation that you want to chat about or things to offer. So again, thank you so much. It's fun to learn as a community, isn't it? Uh, so I will, I will see you soon. And again, I have to sign off here, don't I? <laughs> you know? Oh, there we are. I'm sorry. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.